All right, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John. We're going to look at verse 12, verse 37 through 50. We're going to dive back into the Gospel of John. You've had a couple of months off, and, uh, and so, but now we're going to jump back into that. And uh, we're, we're going to continue in John through Resurrection Sunday and, and into the month of May or June or July, but, but probably May. That's what it looks like right now, okay? But things change as you dig in. Sometimes that sermon, uh, that one sermon, uh, when you get the, the spirit of editing and grace comes upon you becomes a series. Uh, you know, and so, uh, anyway, so we're going to look at, at verses uh, 37 through 50, and uh, we will address first the issues of signs, wonders, and unbelief in verses 37 through 43, and then Jesus, uh, in verse uh, 44 through 50, sums up his ministry, but he sums up the issue of signs, wonders, and, and unbelief, and we're going to look at that. And uh, all mankind is judged according to belief, faith, uh, or uh, belief in faith or, or unbelief. And, and so it's amazing that when it comes to unexplainable events or provisions uh, and how differently these things are seen by believers and unbelievers. And the question I would ask you is, do you see coincidence or the hand of God? As a believer in Jesus Christ, we believe that God is always at work all around us. And we do pray, we do believe that the, the prayers of the righteous availeth much, that, that, that God hears and cares for his people. And there are times when the, the unexplainable occurs. And what do we do with that? You know, how, how, do, we, how do we look at that? And, and uh, everything is seen differently by a believer as opposed to an unbeliever. Uh, it's either a wild coincidence or it's, it's the miraculous hand of God. You see that in the explanation of creation. Uh, and so you and I see beyond a, a big bang or, or whatever the latest scientific theorem is to the big banger, the hand behind it all, the source of all life, who is our creator. And we call that big banger Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Right? And, and, and we, we see him as someone that we can have a relationship. But now, many will see a crazy coincidence of cosmic chemistry and explosion, implosion, metamorphosis, and, and ancient aliens. But where did the ancient aliens come from, right? I've never had that explained. Any theory will do as long as I don't have to acknowledge the higher, holy other creator to whom we owe our existence. Well, today, and I point some things out to you. I want to think about this. The same people that saw God do the works uh, of the plagues and, and uh, the uh, deliverance from Egypt. Think about this. The same people who saw all of that, they brought the mighty, wealthy nation of Egypt to its knees. They, they brought them to... Uh, they, they, pillaged them on their way out. They were so glad to get rid of them that they take our gold, take our cattle, just leave. And God had done that work over the course of a couple of years, really. And they'd seen all of those miracles. They'd seen God at work in their hands. Those are the same people who cried at Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea just a couple of years later and said, oh, we should never have left Egypt. It would have been better. We could have, we could have been slaves there, and now we're going to die in the desert. And, and these people here, they're going to kill us. They're like giants. Oh, my gosh. We're so... They'd seen all the work of God, but when it came down to it, they, they were still filled with unbelief. It's interesting that when you get 40 years later and the spies go into Jericho and, and they see Rahab, and she says, hey, you know, We've been afraid of you all for 40 years. We knew this was coming. We heard about what your God did, and we've been terrified for 40 years that you were going to do to us, your God was going to do to us what he did to Egypt. All right? And so we think about that. It, we kind of get caught up in that. Uh, you know, uh, we, where are we in that scale of belief and, and unbelief? Well, 
it's important, it's important that you and I believe and agree that God is still in the signs and wonders business. Now that doesn't make us Pentecostal. You don't have to jump a pew or, or anything to, to be admitted into our church. You don't have to run, run the aisle. Although if you want to run the aisle, okay, it might liven things up. right? You know, but we don't have to have the big show in here to understand that God is a God of signs and wonders. And, uh, but those signs and wonders don't always uh, manifest themselves as big explosive events. It could be as simple as speaking to someone. Or it could be as simple as saying, you know what, this is the person I need to invest in. This is the least likely, but this is, and it turns out that that's the person that, you know, wow, God had a plan for. God, God has, a, and so we have to understand, God's in the business of signs and wonders. And I want to point you back to this statement. It goes back to the, the Experiencing God study from Blackaby, but, but it's, it, it, it holds its weight uh, 30 years later. Listen, God is always at work all around us. And it is on us to join him in his work where we are. And so as we look at that, let's look at signs and wonders and unbelief. Uh, the truth of the matter is that there are three basic responses to the mighty work of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's doubt. There's dismissal, and there's faith or belief. So beginning in verse 37, it said, Even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe him. Now I want you to understand this is, takes place during the Passion Week. This takes place during the week leading up uh, to the crucifixion of Christ. So he's been there. His ministry has been around three, have been going on for around three years. It started up in Galilee, uh, and, and, and then it, it went through Samaria, and he's been made uh, multiple appearances in Jerusalem and caused to stir there every time. And, and there has been this huge groundswell, and then he laid heavy teaching on them, and some people pulled back. But still, uh, he, they had seen so much, so many things, so many uh, miracles, and, and so many. Uh, healings and, and had heard so much truth and powerful teaching. He said, even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe him. But this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet who said, Lord, who's believed our message? And who is the arm of the Lord been revealed to? And this is why they were unable to believe, because Isaiah also said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they would not see with their eyes or understand with their hearts and be converted. He says, they would be converted, I would heal them. And Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many did believe. Many did believe in him, even among the rulers. Because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, so they would not be banned from the synagogue, for they loved the praise from men more than praise from God. So as we look at this passage, we look at verses 37 through 40, one of the things we want to address is, is this deterministic predestination or the confirmation of free will? You know, one of the things that our world uh, loves, oh, free will, I have the right to choose. And God gives us free will and the right to choose. What God does not give us is freedom from the consequences of our choices. Right? Now, but now our world believes once, once a God that gives us freedom from the consequences of our choices. Right? Listen, I want to take in about eight to 12,000 calories a day and, and not have to work hard. But I want my pants still to fit. But there are consequences to those actions, right? Uh, you know, you, we, we just know how that's going right? to... I, we all live with the consequences of our choice each and every day. That, that's just part of life. You have the freedom of choice. You have free will. But understand, we don't have freedom from the consequences of those choices. right? Addiction uh, is, is a consequence of usage. 
right? And so we have to look at that. And so as we think about this, we have free will. Now, some would say, take it to a very hyper-Calvinistic area and say, well, God has determined or predestined who he is and who will. God has knowledge of that, but all can come to the Father. And so when he quotes Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah 53.1. And I want you to notice, he says, who has heard? He says, who, who has heard uh, our message? Who has believed our message? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? He then goes through in Isaiah 53 and describes the work of the Messiah who did not fit uh, the parameters that the people wanted. They wanted a king like David. He came as a suffering service, the servant, the Lamb of God. And Isaiah 53 predicts the rejection of the Messiah, that he would be beaten and abused and slain for our benefit. And by his stripes we are healed. And by his blood we are cleansed. And so as he looks at this, he says, listen, God, you know, we, we could tell you there are going to be those who are not going to believe. There are going to be those who will experience the miraculous hand of God and they will never turn to God. Now that's not a new thing. Like I say, he delivered Israel from Egypt and what did they do? They started worshiping a cow made of gold because that was similar to what they had seen other people do. And so, as we look at that, there are going to be some that, that believe and some that don't believe. In verse 40, he quotes Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, and he refers to the lack of understanding and belief and the repetitive pattern of unbelief and idolatry that had been a part of the kingdom or the nation of Israel and Judah. When God called Isaiah in chapter 6, he said, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, angels were flying around singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All right? And then uh, he said, man, I don't belong here. I'm a man of unclean lips and live around uh, an idolatrous people. I don't belong here. And so the angels came with a, a coal from the fire and, and, and seared his tongue and said, you've been cleansed. You've, you've been cleansed and now you, you're ready. You're here. And, and the voice cried out, hey, who shall I go? Who shall I send and who will go for, more, for me? And Isaiah makes that famous statement, here am I, send me, Lord. And then God drops the bomb on him. Yeah, they ain't going to listen. That's really what he says. He says, in verse 6, he talks about it. He goes, hey, listen, their, their eyes are going to be hardened. Their, 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 heart, their hearts are going to be hardened. Their eyes are going to be blind. And, and so you and I can do our best to present Jesus in the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we love, the way that we give. And, and there are going to be those who are going to reject that because what's going on in the world around them is more enticing and tantalizing. You know, listen, there's no end of people who were raised in Christian homes, given the opportunity to be born-again believers and follow the way of Christ, who have left our own human free choice. Now I'm just going to say, I do not land on the side of deterministic predestination. I believe that God knows, but he is not determined. I don't think that Jesus would have sent us out to make disciples of all nations and to share, spread the gospel if it were not a possibility that any and all could receive Christ. I believe that salvation is available for all. It's not automatic. And I also understand that men and women have rejected God from the beginning. I mean, Adam and Eve walked with him in the garden, face to face, uninhibited. And they disobeyed. 
Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord and he believed. It was life-changing. He brought the word of that glory to Israel and Judah and they rejected it. Some will believe, some will reject the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. They'll reject the power and majesty of God Almighty. Our purpose is to provide a platform of, for belief and the opportunity to turn from unbelief and self-determination to faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. But understand this, nobody bats a thousand. A couple of years after I started uh, as, as, a, as a prison chaplain, a local minister said, well, you know, I have some experience in law enforcement. Okay. Yeah, those inmates find Jesus in prison and leave him there. And my response was, well, tell me, what's your secret? He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, obviously, your church is batting a thousand. Everyone who comes through the door of your church receives Christ, never wavers, never backslides, or, you know, they never reject Christ. Obviously, you're betting a thousand. So tell me your secret. Well, well, I didn't say that. Okay. So you're saying that people can come to your church and leave him there. You see... Some will believe. Some will receive. There will be great stories of deliverance and salvation, and there will be great disappointments. Okay. But because there's the possibility of great disappointments, doesn't, should not dissuade us from seeking the great opportunity for victory and miraculous uh, restoration and healing, and hope. And so as we look at that, many did believe. Look at verse 42 and 43. Many did believe. He says, listen, uh, many did believe, but because of the Pharisees, even some of the rulers believed, but they did not publicly confess him because they didn't want to be banned from the synagogue. They had too much to lose, for they loved praise from men more than the praise from God. They believed, but they lived in the fear of men, and they believed, but they valued possession and possession more than confession. They believed, some believed in boldness. There were others who spoke of it, but others believed in secret. They acknowledged God, but I want to tell you this, acknowledgement of God without surrender is powerless. Well, I acknowledge there's a higher, a higher being, a higher, okay, well, you acknowledge that. Are you ready to surrender to his will so you can experience the power of a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I acknowledge that there could be. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty Pretty much a toothless statement. And so some believed in boldness, but acknowledgement without surrender is powerless. They believed, but they lived in fear. Let's go down to verse 44 uh, through 50. And then we're going to look. So we've seen the, the problem of signs, wonders, and unbelief. So they'd seen three years of miracles, three years of the unexplainable. They'd heard three years of fantastic teaching, life-changing truth. They'd seen all this, and they still, they either did not believe or they were afraid to come out and, and uh, confess it publicly. Let's look at verse 44 through 50. And we're going to talk about the focus of faith and the future fact of judgment. Then Jesus cried out, The one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I've come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I don't judge them. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But the one who rejects me and doesn't accept my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Did you hear that? The word that Jesus spoke, the word of Jesus will, will convict us, will be the judgment on the last day. 
For I have not spoken my own, on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is eternal life. God's command is eternal life. But if I'm disobedient to God's command, what am I rejecting? Eternal life. All right, so here we go. So the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. There's a lot to unpack here. Great theology in this passage. This is a great summary of Jesus' ministry and something that, that helps us to understand. First of all, belief in Jesus. Go to the next slide for me. Belief in Jesus is belief in God. If you're going to accept God, you're going to accept Jesus. You're going to accept the, the Holy Spirit. You're going to acknowledge that belief in Jesus is belief in God. Belief in Jesus is belief in the presence, power, and the work of the Holy Spirit. As you believe in Jesus, you're going to believe in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, the Comforter that He promised us. What did Jesus say? I only told you what the Father said. Is that correct? That's what He says right there. Now we know that Jesus said, listen, in a while the Counselor will come. And he will convict you of all righteousness. And he will lead you to all truth. He will empower you for this journey. He will empower you for this pilgrimage. And so if you believe in Jesus, you're going to believe in the presence and the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. The third thing we want to look at is this. In verse 46, belief in Jesus lights the darkness. He says, I've come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. Now you and I, at one point in our life, were unbelievers, and our understanding was darkened. Right? Did we understand the things of God? I can't understand the things of God outside of the power and the presence of Jesus Christ in my life. And we don't like to think about that, but... Colossians talks about, the listen, we were enemies in our minds, alienated from God because of our behavior, because of who we were. But now we've been made the children of God. As we think about this, I want you to hear this. Listen, belief in Jesus lights the darkness. God says, come to the darkness. So what did they say about the people of Israel and, and also referring to uh, the people here who had seen signs and wonders for three years? He said that, their eyes were blind. Their hearts were hard. And they, their understanding was darkened. They were living in the darkness. Jesus said, I came to light the way so that you don't have to live in the darkness anymore. That you don't have to live in the darkness. And so belief in Jesus lights the darkness. Je Jesus provides everything necessary for life-changing, eternal salvation by grace through faith. And Jesus lights the darkness to save all who believe. Now the Father's command in verse 50 is eternal life. That is Jesus' focus. That is the focus of faith. Life and salvation. Life and salvation are available but not automatic. It's something that is received when you believe. Which leads us to verse 47 and 48. And we talk about the future fact of judgment. First of all, there is grace and forgiveness for repentant believers. Now he said, listen, I'm not, judge, I'm not here to judge the one who hears my words but does not keep it. In other places, he talks about separating from the sheep and the goats. And he also talks about judging, uh, you know, that we will be uh, accountable for our actions in Christ. For there is grace and forgiveness for repentant believers. And we have that, but there is judgment for the unbeliever. The only, the only unforgivable, the only unforgivable sin is the sin of unbelief, the rejection of God the Father, the rejection of Jesus Christ the Son, and the quenching of the Holy Spirit. By the way, if you reject God the Father and you reject Jesus the Son, then you automatically have quenched the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's the only unforgivable sin. Now you think about it. 
you think about all these things. I mean, let's face it. Everybody in this room, at some point or another, has done some pretty creepy stuff. Amen? Amen. All right. I know you might be looking at Pastor, let's not talk about my creepy stuff. Let's talk about their. No, no, no. All right. Yeah. We, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? We, we could go there. But you know what? All of that, when you trust Jesus, it's wiped away, washed away. The only unforgivable sin is the sin of unbelief and the rejection of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing the, the good news is. That sin is forgivable as long as you have breath. So you might have someone that, man, that old coot, he still refuses to accept Christ. Listen, you pray for their salvation until they breathe their last. I've baptized people in their 70s. I've had friends that have baptized people in their 80s. I mean, listen, it doesn't matter. (laughs) At some point, we just desire for people to know Jesus. Now, some would say, well, I'm going to get my party on until it's time. (laughs) Well, that's a dangerous proposition, my friend. Because, you know, I don't know that we all have access to know when it's time. So, so we, we get on that. The gospel either saves you and transforms you from an enemy of God to a born-again child of God with the sure promise of eternal life, or it condemns you to unbelief. Hebrews 9, 27 said, And just as pointed for people to die once, and after this, the judgment. On the last day, we will stand before God. And I want you to look what Jesus said. Uh, Jesus said, listen, on the last day, my work the one who believes in me believes not in me, but in the one who sent me. And I've come to light the world. If you reject that, if you reject Jesus as Savior, if you reject Jesus, the Son of the living God, then you're inviting judgment upon your life. We will either be covered by the righteousness of Jesus through faith or we will stand condemned by unbelief. Let Jesus light the darkness. Let Jesus change your life. Let Jesus secure your eternity. God is always at work around us. Let's not be blind. Don't be deaf. Don't be stubborn and continue in unbelief. Read the word. Listen for the Holy Spirit. Believe and be saved. And let God use you for his glory and his kingdom expansion. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong for 70, 80 years. If you're wrong, you're wrong for eternity. I believe and know that my God is real, alive, and at work all around us. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord, and He will deliver me here to hereafter. The same God that delivered the Israelites out of Egypt and eventually, when they began to obey, delivered them into the promised land, has delivered me from my slavery to sin and guides me through my stubborn disobedience, and he will deliver me to the promised land of that promised inheritance, that heaven that waits, his house. Oh. Today, believe. Believe. And let's be a church that desires to see others believe. Amen.